In this video, we review the concept of an ideal dilute solution in Henry's Law. Our goal in the last few videos has been to try to write the chemical potential of a component in a mixture as a function uh, of concentration parameters. But our overall goal is to really understand how the chemical potential of a substance changes with concentration so that we can then understand properties of solution and how do they change uh, depending on the concentration of each of the components and this uh, chemical potential dependence on the concentration will also allow us to then understand chemical equilibrium a little bit better. Okay, so what we have for now is that uh, for an ideal gas we can write how the chemical potential depends on pressure using that expression and for a liquid uh, ideal solution then you will have that this is uh, what applies. Now this requires that Rolle's law applies throughout the concentration range but uh, we closed the last video showing how when you do binary mixtures of most solutions uh, or, or most combinations uh, of solvents in solution you actually get deviations from that ideal uh, behavior of Rolle's law. What you actually get is graphs that look like this. These are pressure versus composition diagram where you have both components of a mixture, how the vapor pressure uh, changes with composition and, and often oftentimes you find positive and negative cases from that Rolle's law is very rare actually when you have a perfect adherence to Rolle's law throughout the entire concentration range. Right, so then the question is, well, if this only applies for ideal solutions, what is it that we can do when you don't have ideal solutions? So this video allows you to uh, 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 see a little bit how we think about uh, those non-ideal solutions. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take one of these examples and then uh, work through it uh, to show you what Henry's law, uh, why Henry's law is useful on the concept of an ideal dilute solution. I'm going to take a positive deviation, yes, for convenience. Right, so I'm going to plot that graph here, and um, this is going to be pressure as a function of the composition, and I'm going to have two components, uh, A and B. A is black trace, so I have here from 0 to 1, mole fraction of A varying linearly, and then uh, the vapor pressure is going to be 0 if you don't have any A, and it's going to be whatever the vapor pressure of A when pure is when you have only A. Alright, so Raoul's law would be here a straight line connecting these uh, uh, two limits, which I'm going to draw with a dashed trace right here. And then what we see is that uh, if you have a positive deviation, uh, what you find in reality is that this is something like this. Right, so you actually, you do adhere to Raoul's law when the concentration is really, really, really high, like maybe uh, more fraction 0 0.90, 95, or something like that, then you deviate right after that, okay? And you stay above in the case of a positive devi deviation, and eventually uh, you come uh, uh, to zero. Okay, so that's, that's what happens. Now, obviously we can only use this expression uh, from this point on, okay, where you, where you have that, that you follow Raoult's law but elsewhere it looks like you don't follow any law. Well, that actually is not the case. It turns out when you look at the other uh, uh, regime of the concentrations are really, really low concentrations right here, okay, when A would not be the solvent anymore, instead it would be the solute, then what you actually see is that there is a linear dependence of the vapor pressure with concentration as well. The problem is that the dependence is not Raoult's law the dependence is something different. Okay, so you can actually trace another straight line right here, which I'm going to draw like that. All right, and, and again, this is not Raoult's law, this is a different law, but it still tells you that there's the, uh, the linear dependence of the vapor pressure on the composition of A. All right, so that law is actually what we call Henry's law, which you can simply draw as this piece of A is going to be equal to a linear dependence uh, uh, on the mole fraction of A, but of course the intercept with this axis when uh, the mole fraction becomes 1, okay, that is a different value from the vapor pressure when pure, instead that is what we call Henry's constant, which I'm going to write as k sub h from uh, Henry's constant of A, the component A, and prime uh, means that there's going to be a few more versions of this law that we're going to look at. 
Again, that will be here, k h sub a prime. OK, great. So now let's actually draw the other component. This is just for a. Let's see what happens for b. All right, so for b, you would have uh, kind of uh, something similar, right? So I'm going to draw this a little bit different than here. In this case, I'm going to draw here the vapor pressure of b to be lower than the vapor pressure of A when pure. So uh, I'm going to draw this like that. So in this case, B would be less volatile than A. So B going from zero to pure B. All right, and again, what uh, uh, in reality, what you expect is that at high concentrations, you follow Raoult's law, which is the dashed line, right? But then uh, after a while, then you deviate from that, in this case, in a positive way. And then you come to the uh, range of low concentrations, and there's still there are some linear dependence, right? So here, you have a linear dependence, but it should not, uh, uh, or it does not, agree with Raoult's law. Instead, it agrees with a different law, which I'm going to draw like that. Okay. And this is your uh, Henry's constant for the k sub hb prime, and that will be p prime. P uh, of B when uh, pure, when pure. Okay, so uh, that will also be uh, Henry's law for the other component. Okay, great. So uh, uh, now we define what an ideal dilute solution is. All right, so let's focus uh, focus for just a little bit in this uh, range at high concentrations of A, a low concentrations of B. Right. So we have in this range is that A follows Raoult's law and B follows Henry's law. Okay, so the solvent follows Raoult's law, the solute, uh, the one that is in lowest concentration, follows Henry's law. Okay, when you have that behavior right there, that's what you call an ideal dilute solution. Okay, let's see how this applies for the uh, other range of concentration. So right here, in this part of the curve, right, so I'm gonna draw it like this, you had that the uh, uh, component that is majority, the solvent, is B, all right? And B follows Raoult's law. However, the minority component, which is the solute, that is, uh, uh, follows uh, not Raoult's law, instead it follows Henry's law. Okay, so uh, that is the definition of an ideal dilute solution. Okay, again, uh, to reiterate, an ideal dilute solution is a solution in which the majority component, the solvent, follows Raoult's law, and the minority component the solute follows Henry's law. Okay, so in the next videos we're going to see how Henry's law is going to be useful in uh, helping us write the uh, chemical potential for the minority component, right? So for the solute. Okay, and then we'll have here another entry uh, that allows you to calculate that or, or to write that chemical potential as a function of the concentration of the minority component. For now, we're going to wrap up this video by writing here a few uh, other expressions for the chemical, uh, for the uh, Henry's law, and and the only difference between them is how do you express this uh, concentration. So in this particular uh, ca case, we're using mole fraction because that's what we're using in these uh, composition pressure diagrams. But of course, you can express the concentration of of a solute in in many ways. For example, you can use molality, you can use molarity, and there's a Henry's law version. Uh, uh, for each one of those concentrations. So for example, the one that depends on molality would be something like this. P of A would be the molality of A and then a uh, different Henry's constant which would be proportional to each other because in the limit of, of dilute solutions, mole fraction and molality are actually uh, very, uh, are, uh, directly proportional to each other. Okay, so, so these constants are also proportional to each other. And then if you use molar concentration, then what you could have is write this Henry's law uh, a little bit different. So you could write here a molar concentration uh, and then a different uh, Henry's constant. And again, all of these Henry's constants are related to each other because these concentrations are also related to each other in the limit of, of dilute solutions. Okay, this one is actually one that is quite useful. And the one, uh, and, and generally we recast this, this expression uh, a little bit differently to solve for uh, the molar concentration. And then we say that the molar concentration is simply going to be equal to the partial pressure of A times the inverse of this constant, which we simply call Henry's constant. 
Okay, so again, these are four different versions of Henry's uh, law, and uh, they have four different constants. The question is, how do you tell them apart? Well, in problems, you're going to have the values of those Henry's constant, so you actually can know which one is which from the units of uh, Henry's constant. Right? Notice that in this particular case, right, the units of Henry's constant should be pressure. Okay, but in this particular case, it should be pressure divided over molality units. Here you will have pressure divided over molarity units, and here you will have that this Henry's constant has uh, units of molarity units divided over pressure. Okay, so, so again, from that unit analysis, you can find out uh, which version of the Henry's law you need to use for a particular problem. All right, so in this video, we have seen uh, ideal dilute solutions, right? And, and uh, we have seen how in ideal dilute solutions, you have that for the solvent, Raoult's law applies, and then for the solid, Henry's law applies. In the next videos, we're going to see a few applications of Henry's law, why is it important, and we're also going to see how to write the chemical potential for the solid component in an ideal dilute solution.